G'day. It's Scotty from Zenium Real Wealth and the Real Property Real Wealth podcast. On this episode, we have Mark McGill. He was once an architect and he's now turned himself into a real estate agent about nine years ago. I don't really care so much that Mark's a real estate agent, but what I do care about is that he's done very, very well out of investment property and he's done that because of the skills he learned as an architect. So we're going to pump him for that information and find out what makes his brain tick when he looks for investment properties and what are some of the design trends that are absolutely paramount when choosing the right investment property. So grab a drink, grab a notepad and listen to this episode with Mark McGill. A quick word. For the first three minutes, we had some audio problems, so stick with it, because it's very worthwhile listening to the whole thing and hanging in there for the great information from Mark McGill. All right, that's it. Let's have a listen. G'day and good evening. It's Scotty from Zenium Real Wealth, and this is our first week in September uh, where we have a guest speaker on. And our guest this evening is the wonderful and uh, almost as good looking with his hair, Mark McGill. How you going, Mark? Yeah, good, mate. Spring has sprung. Unfortunately, my hair hasn't quite yet, but we'll get there. <laughs> I celebrate 20 years this year since uh, beating baldness uh, with a razor. Wow. So uh, yeah, it's a big, big year for me. Uh, for those of you tuning in, if you missed uh, our last week's webinar, it was a bonus session because we had a five-week month, and we spoke to Todd O'Neill on structures for finance so make sure you check that out in the Zenium vault all right so i've known mark since right when he joined the uh the real estate activities and uh and decided to be an agent and that's when we first crossed paths uh yeah, crossed yeah. paths and we were uh, introduced to each other how many years ago was that mate nine nine and a half years ago nine years all right there you go all right so I didn't get Mark on this evening because he is a real estate agent. He's done very well for himself, and perhaps we can do another session on that. We're not really in the in the uh, business of necessarily just chatting to real estate agents for the sake of it. The reason we got Mark on was because Mark wasn't always a real estate agent. In fact, you started out as an architect. What the heck, mate? Yeah, correct. So I was a registered architect. I still keep my registration do my CPD. Um, but basically, I um, I was working as an architect in the GFC. What was happening was that all of the developer clients were going broke and left us owing a lot of money. So what I was doing to try and generate more architectural business was I was running around to all the real estate agents and I was basically doing concept designs for them, uh, asking them what old houses they had that could do renovations or doing town planning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I was hoping that that would generate new business for us. Um, unfortunately, what happened was that all the real estate agents made a ton of money selling my ideas and <laughs> I didn't get any business out of it. Amber said, you're not, you're doing the work, you're getting paid for it. And she made a job available for me. Um, my first ever listing was in my first two weeks, I rang up all of my friends who were on the market, someone had a property on the market for 12 months. They couldn't sell it. They gave me an open list and said, good luck, Mark. Um, I worked out uh, within two hours, I worked out you could fit 42 dwellings on the property. In 19 phone calls, I found a buyer for that property at 1.215 million in Namble. There you go. The rest of history. So for those of you who don't know where Namble is, you can obviously Google it, uh, but it's, it's uh, not the highest value uh, suburb on the Sunshine Coast. Um, it's 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 a nice place, but it's definitely not the highest value. So that's a very good result back uh, nine years ago, mate. Oh, it was heard of. Yeah. So um, that's the first thing that uh, that I guess is two points of why I want to talk to you tonight. That was what you well, you know why you transitioned from an architect to real estate agent. But the, going along with that is uh, I've watched you be very successful in your property investing. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, during our chatting offline, um, you mentioned to me there's some specific strategies that you use that you know, from skills you learned from being an architect and, yep. and apply that to your property investing. And that's the sort of stuff that we want to talk to you about this evening. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I mean, um, a lot of it is to do with um, getting a good understanding of 
what people want and how they live in homes. And good design does smell, and good design is timeless. Um, you know, having a good understanding of what buyers are attracted to, always I find underpins the property no matter what the market's like. You'll always sell a good property. Um, whether it's a good market or a bad market, it will still always have buyer appeal. Um, so, for example, um, and, and then I do a lot of analysis of what the buyers are looking for in my particular area or that particular suburb. So I have always personally tried to buy what is in high demand um, and in short supply. So if I get a lot of buyers all asking me, and, and you'd get this yourself, Scott, as a buyer's agent, you'd get a lot of people saying, I want, this is my wish list of what I want. And you would see a common theme in the wish list of what people are wanting. And it might be, say, a two bedroom, two bathroom, close to the beach, low body corporates, ground floor with a lock up garage, and my budget's 400 grand. And you would almost scoff at that going, I wish I could find stock like that. Um, so that's pretty much what I look for. I look for what the market is screaming for. And that's where I see the opportunities. Okay, that's that's good. So uh, obviously, the things that you learned as as an architect, you know, what are some key points there? That mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, there's plenty of people change roles and change careers and become a real estate agent, and they could be a tradie, they could be in finance, they could be in what whatever manufacturing. Yeah. Um, and everyone is going to have what we call experiential viewpoint, and that's like their, their experiences create their view. Um, but, you know, with you, you're on the, the edge of like the designing of the property and, and sort of that planning process and that. So how does that affect uh, you identifying what types of property to buy? Uh, probably the main thing is orientation. Um, for me, because I can see past a lot of cosmetic things and a lot of I, I look at the structure and the bones of a property, and look at the layout. Um, essentially, the only thing you can't really change is where the property is located. I and mean, they say location is everything. Um, and I mean, pretty much everything else you can essentially change, um, just depending on budget and whether it's worth doing. Um, but yeah, like one of my um, well, one of my first properties actually was um, it's a two bedroom unit in Alexander Headland. Um, when I looked at it, I worked out that where the plumbing fixtures were and the size and square metres of the apartment, it was a two-bedroom, one-bathroom apartment. And I worked out that if I was to renovate it within the same budget, I could actually fit a second bathroom in the same footprint. So that renovation changed the product type from a two-bed, one-bathroom apartment to a two-bed, two-bathroom apartment, which is in short supply and in high demand in that particular suburb where I purchased side and, and, and I guess the site selection as well. I mean, you talk about aspect, but what about design keys? I mean, I know that some of the properties that you have got yourself that uh, was sort of for some specific reasons, like that design was timeless or that was, and I know when, I, when you do a lot of the listings, you make that sort of mention in your ad and you talk about design. Just take us through a bit of the process on that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so um, Probably some of the properties that I've purchased myself design-wise, um, like I said, I look at what I feel the market will respond to. So the last one that I bought off the plan, actually, when I read the plans, it had a big 26 square metre balcony, which is a really unique design feature. Um, people in Queensland love living outdoors. It's part of our lifestyle here. Uh, and it was facing in a good orientation. So it was an east, northeast facing balcony. So it gets morning sun and, and good sunlight all day. Um, the building was on, the unit was on the end of the building. So it had three external walls, which meant it got a lot of natural light and a lot of natural ventilation. Um, because I bought early, I managed to secure a top floor, which had the premium views as well. And um, from a design point of view, what I really liked about that one was that the bedroom, the master bedroom and the second bedroom had really good separation of living. Um, so master bedroom had an ensuite, um, and then the second bedroom was tucked around at the other end of the apartment. Uh, it was divided by the living areas and the kitchens. So essentially, um, two people could independently live in that apartment in like a room sharing, uh, like housemate sharing arrangement, 
which would always help underpin and protect the rent because I know that um, in this particular area, uh, renters um, in a share housing accommodation set up would pay extra having their own private room and bathroom. Um, little design things like I put TV points into every bedroom um, so that they could uniquely um, work from each bedroom. And I also look at bedroom sizes because same sort of thing in a share accommodation scenario. Um, large bedroom sizes allow people to do more and, and cohabitate more easily uh, because they can have more of a private setup in their own bedroom. <laughs> You're saying because you access that property uh, off the plan early, you could make some of those adjustments. Um, yes. You know, before you took possession of it or during the build process. Now, look, we we're not big fans here of buying off the plan in terms of apartments, especially like we do a lot of with house and land and duplexes and flipping and that sort of stuff. But off the plan, off the plan apartments obviously has a pretty bad stigma about it. Um, you, you don't need to go very far to find that. But you you have been very successful at that process. Now, is that just because you make those design tweaks or is there some secret that you can tell us? Um, in, in, the most recent one, in, the, in the most recent one I sold, I did actually make design tweaks to it. Uh, they weren't substantial. Like the base plan was very good. Um, the only tweaks that I really made... Um, because like I said, the good thing about buying off the plan was I got the premium choice in um, location in the building. But the trick is to buy early because most of the developers um, have their best pricing at the first release. Uh, and then typically prices will increase as the development rolls out and closer to completion. Um, with the one that I purchased, um, one of the small design changes I made was I put separate toilets into the ensuite and into the um, into the main living area. So it was like a powder room set up, um, which privatised it. The other minor change that I made uh, was from an investment property point of view, was just running the tiles all the way to the ceiling, so floor to ceiling tiles. Um, and then the, and then we talked about it before. I added TV points and additional power points. Um, in places. So it's not big ticket items, but they were little minor tweaks that I could easily make, um, which gave my property a point of difference over everything else in the marketplace. Because as you know, um, especially with established properties and especially with established units, once they're built, it's very hard to change services like plumbing and uh, electric. So getting in early um, and making those changes early was actually quite profitable for me. Yeah, I, I bet, mate, I bet. All right, so that's that's those identifying those things before you buy. Um, what, you know, what has been the developers, uh, I guess, is there any resistance that they have when you want to make some of these changes or are they very accommodating because you're, like, first on the scene? Uh, more often not because I'm first on the scene. Um, they are quite accommodating within reason. Like, you still need to have a bit of an understanding of what is possible and what's going to be um, uh, simple to do and what's difficult to do. So changing walls and changing plumbing can have significant knock-on effects, especially in a, in a uh, apartment building. Not so much in a, in a townhouse or a, or a house. It's a bit easier to change services around. But definitely in a multi-storey building, um, changing plumbing can be a real nightmare. Um, so that's something that developers are typically reluctant to do. Uh, probably it's more the practical features. Um, I consulted, um, I do a lot of consulting with developers on product mix. So even a basic thing like making fridges one metre wide and putting plumbing taps into the fridge spaces so that people can have a ice maker fridge. Um, it's funny how many people um, I've seen not buy a property because they can't fit their fridge in. So... Um, being able to have a design or, or have a property that adapts and caters to that just puts me a step above the other competition. Yeah, look, and that's that's a really good uh, point you make there because that was my next point on my list is uh, obviously when you look at a property, um, you look at things from a buyer's perspective uh, mm -hmm. as an investor, 
you can look at it from an architect's perspective and you can look at it from a real estate agent's perspective. So what are some of the biggest, you know, stuff ups you've seen in terms of property or the things that are most off putting for people when they come to inspect it, or i.e. the reverse of that, what makes the property the hardest to sell? Okay, well, um, off the plan, funnily enough, south facing is really hard to sell off the plan. Um, but I've actually worked on developments where the best aspect actually is south facing uh, yeah. in, in, in the building because like that's where you get the best ocean views. So sometimes in that particular building, there was some really excellent opportunities because um, the south facing ones are harder to sell off the plan. They were obviously discounted in price compared to their north facing identical um, uh, comparisons. Um, but people didn't comprehend the fact that the best views and the best orientation uh, was actually that southern side. So that was actually a good buying opportunity in that particular building. Um, so south facing is typically harder to buy and sell, um, but good design can overcome that um, because the good thing with south facing is you can have more natural light into a building. So if you do have a southern facing uh, property, uh, have you have the opportunity to have larger expanses of glass uh, because you're not getting direct sun and direct heat on it. Um, so you can filter a lot more natural light and it's a softer light. Um, so that's probably a big one. Bedroom sizes are a big thing for buyers. Um, probably a minimum sort of expectation now is to be able to fit a king size bed into uh, all bedrooms. That seems to be the, the norm. Um, and I think really, what we're seeing is we're seeing more people sharing houses and share accommodation. So I think the more opportunity for a property to have people that can live independently of each other and then meet in the middle is a good design trade as well. Even in a two bedroom unit, as long as there's good separation, what I've found is when two bedrooms are butting up against each other, their walls are backing onto each other, people feel like they're going to be on top of each other and there's an intrusion. So having, say, bedrooms divided by living areas or by kitchen areas or bathrooms is a good design trend. Um, kitchens, I mean, you've only got to watch half a dozen renovation shows. The kitchens are a, a big thing. Um, having a one-metre wide fridge recess with plumbing, uh, I think, is an absolute essential. So people... I'm, I'm finding people store more stuff in the fridge than what they do in the pantry now. So having bigger fridge uh, recesses. Um, this is a personal thing for me, but like I love my wine. So I've got to accommodate wine fridges in everything that I, I look at. <laughs> Not a, that's uh, a, it's, it's something. You can't tell that from the picture behind you either. Yeah, like. I know. There's only three wine fridges behind me. So, yeah. Um, uh, so look, one of the, um, the, and, and this is where we get to some personal stuff, like you're talking about the wine and I'm going to talk about something a little bit more practical. One of the things I absolutely detest is that I'm totally okay with having a toilet in an ensuite, but I hate having toilets in the main bathroom. If we don't have a separate toilet in the main mm -hmm. part of the house, it just yep. makes it completely unusable. And we, we inspect properties and I, I, just, I just turn around and walk out. Yeah, look, I think it depends how you handle it, but I do agree. Like even that small design change that I made in my own purchase, I separated the toilet from the main bathroom so that I created a powder room and then the second bathroom became like a pseudo ensuite for the second bedroom. Um, so, yeah, I do think separate toilets is a design trend that people do like um, because, as you said, like you think about sharing a property with multiple people, you don't want someone waiting for the toilet or you've got guests coming over. Your guests have to wait for your housemate to free up the bathroom before your guests can go to the toilet. Otherwise, they've got to go through your master bedroom. Um, so that's neither is a really acceptable outcome. So, yeah, powder rooms are definitely a, a design trend that we are seeing uh, is resonating with buyers. Yeah, I 100% I agree. Mate, just from the practicality of like, you know, if you, if you end up with kids and, you know, one of them's in the bathroom and then none of them go to the toilet, it's it's not pretty. You don't want those kids going to the toilet in your ensuite. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, well, I don't have kids, but um, I'll, I'll take your word on that. 
No, that's all right. I'm just saying that's, that's something to look forward to. And, and at least you're preparing yourself with wine because that's something that you will need when you ever have children. So that's yeah. okay. But I, so, but I think, all right, so we touched on that design and we touched on off the plan. Um, have you ever had a house that you can't sell due to design? Yes. We've, sometimes you just can't fix them. Um, and, I mean, I've come up with creative ways to be able to renovate them and improve them, but the hard part with that is um, it becomes cost prohibitive then because sometimes the amount of money that is needed to spend on the property will raise it above the the ceiling of price ranges in that particular area or suburb. Um, more often than not, <coughs> I actually see this problem with people who typically buy the cheapest house in the street and... Um, they think that they can renovate it and make it work and unfortunately they're just stuck with the previous constraints and problems of the previous property. Um, so, yeah, I think you've got to be really careful about that. Sometimes it's more beneficial to spend more and buy something that's already done that's got good design and good orientation already um, and let the benefit of time and the market make your growth. Um and then other times, um, yeah, I've seen way too many people overcapitalise. Yeah, okay. Because obviously that's that's the decision you've got to make, right? If you, if something's not selling well and you go, okay, well, we can do a reno, we can do a, you know, this yeah. or that to change it. But, you know, at what point is, is enough enough and really you just got to try and get out of it any way you can? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So, okay. so all right, so... Um, in that instance, I mean, I don't think I've got any clients I can think of that are in that, but you hear the horror stories where you're stuck with the house that can't sell. Is there any sort of secret design tricks that you use to make houses more appealing when you market them? Even good ones or bad ones, doesn't matter, but what's what's the things that you use to entice buyers that makes your properties turn over quicker to any other agent? What's actually funny is... Um this is really basic, but just having them clean, like sparkling, sparkling clean. Um, think about going to like your grandma's place in her 80s. Like you can walk into that house and it's still got the orange bench tops, the brown tiles and and um, and the shag pile carpet and it, it's old and dated, but they sell really, really quickly because they're neat. Like Nana looks after that property and it is spick and span. It's like it's brand new the day you walk in. So having it clean uh, is an absolute must. Um, I've actually had an old property um, in a derelict suburb. We literally got a bond clean in there and they cleaned the walls so well that we actually didn't even need to repaint the property. That's how good the clean brought up the property. So um, we call that what's called a sparkle clean. So a sparkle clean can do a lot. Um, I think with any property, you want to try and increase the amount of light that comes in. So if you haven't got much natural light, I think that's something that really needs to be improved. Um, I think you also need to, and, and so light is a design feature. Like you need to understand um, how the sun works, how orientation works and ways and methods of attracting light. And not only light, but in Queensland, we're subtropical climate. Uh, you want breeze and, and cooling breezes as well. Um, because you don't want to have to rely on air conditioning all the time. So I think they're, they're things that we can tweak. And I, mean, I have done it where we've opened up a wall or removed the wall, uh, and that's not been a major process, um, and that has significantly changed the, the outlook of the property. All right. No, that's, that's good. So I'm assuming, um, considering all the fun you've had investing in property and obviously being a... a a residential sales agent, mm -hmm. um, you're not thinking about going back to architecture? Oh, look, I still, I still love having a dabble in design every now and then. Um, I was actually called out to a property this week and I've just um, I've done just a basic schematic and sketch design. So I do the initial consultation with them um, and then I point them in the direction to an architect that I know and then he'll finish off the work. But at least he's got a design brief that he can work with and he knows the concept of what we're looking at um, in order to get the property ready for selling. So this particular property, um, 
had an outdoor area that was closed. It was really closed off and bricked in, um, and it opened out onto a really great yard space. So uh, just doing a simple flyover roof, knocking out that, that wall and doing a nice outdoor area uh, will really open up that property and it makes it functional and it makes it usable and it will really open up its appeal to a, a broader range of market. All right, so you touched earlier on on design trends and I mean, we're not talking about toilets in bathrooms and stuff like that now. We're talking about sort of, in your experience, is there different design expectations or requirements from different age groups of people that you deal with? Like, you know, say the, the you know, younger people expect this and, and I'm not just talking about people with kids want more rooms. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about literal practical design features. Yeah, uh, look, probably the main one is fridges. Fridges is just everyone's bugbear. Um, so fridge space is a must. Uh, kitchen and entertaining. Um, outdoor area is very big, uh, especially in, in Queensland. Uh, they're probably the main design trends. Um, look, what we're finding, look, every buyer, it doesn't matter age, every buyer wants what they can't have. Like they always want that step above what they can afford. It is always the way and it will be the eternal problem of real estate. Um, but, look, I mean, um, look, I've seen plenty of young buyers wanting something old and, and, um, and something they can make their own. I've seen plenty of people that are older and want the best and the, the best of everything. Money's no object um, because it, it really comes down to what they're purchasing for. Um, if you're purchasing as an investment property, I think you need to be a little bit smarter and take your emotion out of it um, and try and think more practically towards a broader range of uh, potential um, occupiers, not just yourself. Um, and I think I see too many people throw their own um, their own lifestyle over how other buyers would um, would would act. So, for example, um, uh, I'm marketing a development at the moment. People are like I can't fit a big dining table in here. Now mm -hmm. we're finding people don't really have dining tables anymore. Um, people are either entertaining outside, so you have a bigger outdoor entertaining area have your big outdoor entertaining um, tables um, and then the occupants of the property are probably eating at a breakfast bar on, on the kitchen. So if you've got a big kitchen and you've got a big outdoor area, the dining, the, the formal dining room kind of becomes a bit redundant um, and I've seen people skip over investment properties because of that, yet many of the tenants don't really need it. They don't live that way. Um, so they're missing out on good purchasing opportunities, throwing their own uh, perceptions over it. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, a really, really, really good point um, in that people often buy, and as we touched on earlier, the experiential viewpoint, like they're buying as if they're buying it, even though, oh, no, no, it's investment property. I'm only doing it on figures. And uh, when in reality, it's important to know these things. If yeah. that, That's a huge design trend change. And I mean, that's, that's from not just from different mix-ups of family and other bits and pieces, it's literally from um uh you know habits changing people aren't all sitting down at the table anymore as much inside they can sit outside or they're all sitting at the breakfast bar um, yeah. or someone's sitting in the couch uh doing something on a computer while someone else is eating or it's, it's literally lifestyle changing that's mm -hmm. and people aren't keeping up well even media rooms are becoming a little bit redundant because everyone's watching their iphone or tablets now so having a bigger bedroom uh, can, and, and ditching the media room can save you square metres on a build and um, and it's probably not going to make any difference to a particular category of buyers. Um, there are, depending on your category as well, like a family buyer will always want like a separate room for kids to be able to watch a TV in versus the main living area. Well, family buyer would want a separate house for the children, mate, just so yeah. you know, but it doesn't probably. always work. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but like, say for example, a, a, a unit buyer or even like, um, say you're in, in a university area, for example. Um, so if your primary, um, demographic in your particular area is university students or shift workers, a lot of them basically live in their bedroom and then the living areas are kind of a shared quarter. Um, so I think in those situations, if you can design bigger bedrooms and bigger, 
um, bigger en suites, bigger bedrooms, more storage in the bedrooms and set them up almost big enough to have like a separate seat or couch or, or a TV on the wall, etc. cetera. Um, that's almost a better solution than having like a, a media room, which is wasted. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, it would be only just over 10 years ago, we built a house and it was like, if you don't have a media room, you don't build this house. And it was a nice size house and that over at, uh, in a nice area. But to see that that much change happen in 10 years, that's, that's massive, massive changes. Uh, now, look, we, we are very close to calling it an evening. So if anyone has any questions for Mark, punch them into the question bar and the comment bar at the side and we'll throw them to him before he leaves. Uh, Mark, sum up everything you told us, just everything. Every last half an hour, mate, in 30 seconds, what's your top tips for buyers when they're looking for investment property from a design perspective? Look, I, I think um, generally what I look for is good bedroom size. Um, probably take into, into account an ageing population so I think you need to factor in um, wider doorways or wider um, bathrooms, et cetera, um, bathrooms that can be modified with grab rails and um, accessible um, fixtures. Uh, ground floor or minimal stairs is always a popular request. Um, and um, bedrooms with, like, the similar number of bathrooms and, and toilets for the number of bedrooms and occupants of a property. So I think they're probably my main thing. And parking. Parking's also a huge thing. Right. Yep. Well, there you have it, folks. All right. So, Jason, unless you've got any questions that have come through uh, on other means, uh, I'm going to start wrapping it up here. Mark, thank you very much for your time this evening. Hello. It's been, uh, you know, very enlightening. I think it's really important, and I've taken a bunch of notes here, to to really look at um, that design aspect. I love some of the things you said about the south-facing design. Like For me, um, we're currently in a north-facing house and it's just wonderful with the sun. But uh, as you said, you can actually take advantage of that southern design, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the southern aspect with smart design. You can have a lot more glass because I'm telling you, you wouldn't want much glass in our northern part of our house. Like it just gets too hot. It gets way too hot. Yeah, so so that was that was good, mate. That was really good. That and uh, and I loved our uh, our conversations about toilets with two blokes. Everything always ends up at toilets. So there you go. All right, um, that's it for our first week in September. Our special guest tonight was Mark McGill, uh, sales architect. Are you still using that line, mate? Yeah, I still use it a lot of. I, I actually get a lot of people come and get me to pre-consult on their property about three or six months before they even go to market. And when we have these same chats, so we do renovation advice and, and run through whether it's worth doing or, or overcapitalising. There you go. All right, so Mark McGill, sales architect, um, being very successful in being able to choose the right investment properties. As I said in our email and at this, the, the head of the night, one of the few people I know that's actually made good money on off-the-plan apartments and uh and it's been a pleasure to talk to you this evening uh stay tuned for zenium next thursday night is our week two our market update for the month of september so that's our market review we'll look at what htw is saying for the month we'll overlay that on our zenium action compass and we'll see what zach has to say and we'll look at any other relevant news that's coming on that we think is important for us to be aware of all right mark thank you very much once again and from all of us here I'm Scotty at Zenium Real Wealth. Have a good evening. Thanks, Scott. See ya. Yeah.